Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. You were diagnosed at 18. Obviously, that was um, how many years ago was that? 20 years ago or so? Um, it was <laughs> one. I think about seventeen or eighteen years ago. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I don't. I didn't know the maths on that one. I was just throwing it out there. Um, yeah, we're about the same age. I'm a bit older than you. Um, so, and I want to bring this up because you have such a great response to this, and I think it is important that people see it. whether they choose to have that mentality. And it's there's there's no, um, you know, um for everybody else to feel like this because everyone will handle it in their way. But I feel like it's, you're creating a safe space to play on it. So talk to us a little bit about that time of your life and how you found out. Um, so yeah, I was 18. I just started year 12. Yeah. Um, and a couple of things that had happened, you know, I had a sinus infection earlier on in the year. So in like the December, January, mm. and I just hadn't really recovered well after that um but i was having a lot of symptoms of other things so um i wasn't having real breaks in my period i had lost a bit of weight but for me i'd put that down to i was running a bit i was you know enjoying that i was eating well so you know and i'd started even swimming i think so i was like great you know that's just part of it it wasn't a dramatic loss, but it was a loss that was noticeable. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so some of those symptoms that were coming up were symptomatic of cervical cancer. Now, because I had cancer in my family, not specifically cervical cancer, but cancer in our family, um, we thought to get some bloods done um, yeah. to just check what's going on. Um, and the weekend before I got my diagnosis, I was playing netball out at Simpson, um, which is another country town here. Mm -hmm. um, which is a couple of hours away from Melbourne for anyone who's not um, listening in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Super good footballers and netballers come from Simpson. I okay. come from Simpson just for the big view. Yeah. Um, but we were playing and we'd finished the game and I was – I couldn't explain to you just how thirsty I was. I was so incredibly thirsty, but I was so full to the brim from drinking so much water. And my mum being a nurse, I said to her, I'm like, oh, mum, I'm just, I'm so thirsty, but I cannot physically drink anymore. I feel like I'll vomit if I have any more water, but I'm just so thirsty. And you could just see in mum's head that she was like, Okay, yeah. And then Dad had made a comment, which I thought was super rude. <laughs> but he, like in the morning when I got up, he said, oh, my God, your breath stinks. I was like, how rude. I have been <laughs> sleeping all night. <laughs> I haven't brushed my teeth yet. I bet yours do too, like rude. And, um, yeah, and then when I was diagnosed, my I still don't know why I should probably ask her, but she came round my auntie and gave me the news that she's like, well, your bloods have come back and it, it shows that you've got type one diabetes. And when I first saw her come, my heart kind of dropped because I thought, Oh my God, she wouldn't come here to tell me these things. If something wasn't, you know, no, if everything was okay, she wouldn't be here. You know, mm. she'd just be like, oh, I'll tell you over the phone. Yeah. But the fact that she'd come there, I was like, this is not good. Mm. But when she said that it was type 1 diabetes, I was like, is that all? Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to school. I'll chat to you later. And she's like, well, no, no, no. You've got type 1 diabetes. That means you need to be on insulin today. Like, you need to come to Geelong now. We need to go. And I was like, oh. Oh, okay. All right. You know, let's go. It was just very nonchalant, I guess. I, because I thought what I could have is so severe yeah. 
yeah. and life-threatening, that that was my main thought was, well, thank God it's not that. I'll just deal with this. This is fine. Yeah. Thank goodness it's not that. Maybe that's why you've got a, such a good positive mindset around it because those feelings have kind of stuck with you going, well, I could have had cancer and it yeah. isn't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That could be like the root of it, I suppose. Yeah. And my best mate, um, she's been diabetic, like type 1 diabetic since she was three. Mm. And I remember, you know, when we're kids, we always just, as you do, shoot the shit with your friends and, you know, are mean to one another in a way. And I always used to go around to her house, um, you know, spend time with her, but I always used to go around early knowing full well that she'd be in the shower and I'd go there and clean her room because she'd always have a really messy room and it would just get to me. It's weird that you'd want to clean her room. I know. I'm a strange person, Andy. Like I said, not everyone's cup of tea. but It's, it's hilarious. Like, that's, I wouldn't say that's not my cup of tea. Come and clean. So I asked a lot of people. <laughs> You put yourself down. I think most people want a friend that can come around and clean up, to be fair. I I would love to be a house cleaner. It sounds weird. (laughs) Good on you. I just like when everything's so nice and clean. I was like, I did that. (laughs) Um, But I used to clean her room and she'd get out of the shower and be like, oh. She's like, I thought I heard the vacuum. And she's, uh, I said to her, I'm like, I'm going to curse you with spiders because this is ridiculous the way that you put stuff everywhere. And she's like, well, I'm going to curse you with diabetes. And we were just like, <laughs> and then I rang her the day that I was diagnosed. I was like, you witch. <laughs> like your little cursing idea has come to full fruition and now I'm going to have to get insulin and everything and she's like well about time (laughs) you know like so it was I think we're just especially having her because I knew everything about it because I had to when I was with her yeah I had to know if she took too much insulin or you know if she was having a hypo or hyper I had to know what to do if I was going to be spending time with her especially outside of you know our parents houses and um I think because I knew a bit of what it was about obviously not everything but I knew a bit of what it was about I'm like yeah well I can do that Jess does but I can do that that's probably downplayed it in your mind you having it too not only the cancer but because you've been around it and you've seen it and you've felt it from a, another friend as well and, and, and you know what's coming and you know what to do. That's I think that's probably half the battle for most people, isn't it, who have yeah. to then change the life in this way and how I they... Think, I think then too, like on the other hand of things, I saw it that way. I still very much um, can be quite jovial about things, mm. but diabetes can actually be very scary and also can burn you out it is something that you have 24 hours a day seven days a week when you get up and have breakfast in the morning do you have to count all the carbs that you're having and put that into an insulin pump or do you have to figure out the carb to insulin ratio and put insulin in your pen and and do all of that that's something that we're thinking about all the time and that yeah. never goes. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, my sister up until a few years ago had never seen me um, have a hypo because you just do things and get on with things and make sure you don't get to that point. Yeah. But because I'm always thinking about it, that's why she didn't see things like that. Yeah. 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 Did, did your life change dramatically from that point onwards? even with that positive mentality mentality i think maybe for my parents it did i don't know for me all Mm. that much okay i mean like i said i there's still points that i go oh god i wish i could just down a whole packet of lollies over there and Mm. not have to worry or think about how many carbs that's worth and give myself insulin for that you know, I not that I don't, I still do, but I feel rather guilty about it. Um, but the thing is with diabetes, it is not that you can't live a normal life. Yeah, It's just that bit harder. And yeah. that's the way 
I see it. I know that may hurt other people because it can be a real struggle. And I think too, I was lucky in the fact that I was a lot older and had been, um, you know, shown what that life can be like through my best mate. But also my mum's a nurse. I understood those things because I had the people there to explain it to me well. Yeah. But yet, um, you know, I've got other family and I, I won't say who, but other family that their child got diagnosed and that's a huge whirlwind. When it is a child, you are up all the time. It's like having a newborn again. Mm. You're finger pricking overnight before everyone had the constant glucose monitors. You're up all the time checking. If there's an alarm, you've got to be with them because they haven't had hypos before. They may not show symptoms like an adult does or they have different things. It's just, you know, my hats go off to parents that their children are getting diagnosed when they're so little because your world would change dramatically. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't as dramatic as it would be if one of my children got it. Yeah, sure. Which is very likely. It's yeah. a lot higher now because mm. I'm the carrier yeah. that my children could have it. And I know that there's a test that you can have to see if they have, you know, those markers to get it. But I'm in the mindset of if it happens, it happens. I don't want to be worrying all day, every day about, well, you know, Max has got markers for it. What if it happens tomorrow? What yeah. if it's cold turns into this and then we end up in ICU? What, you know? Of course. I don't, don't want to spiral when I don't need to. Mm. If it happens, it happens, I'll deal with it then. If it doesn't, great. What do you think, and they're all very good, yeah, and that's a good mentality to have, and I, I love that because you can't live your life like that. But what was, the, what is, was there a root cause for you, do you think? Because obviously a lot of diabetes can be, not always, um, presented because of the, obviously the types of foods that we eat, uh, what foods we eat and so on. But with yours, um, type one obviously is quite extreme, isn't it? You, we can't reverse type one, which I learned from you. And but all the other studies that I've read with other types of diabetes, we can look at reversing, not necessarily solving, but reverse um, by giving the a liver a big, big break from a lot of the sugary foods that we eat. Was there a, a root cause f for you? Was there any trauma? Was there anything else that co triggered anything? that yeah. you're aware of so diabetes can there's not just like type 1 and type 2 there's actually several different types of diabetes yeah. nowadays but i won't go into them all mm. but you get diabetes from a lot of different things you can get um gestational diabetes so when you're pregnant but also you could have more susceptibility to having type 1 later on in life mm -hmm. or type 2 right um there's type 1 which i got yeah which they think the root cause of that was from when I had that sinus infection. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. That I didn't recover. Yeah. But, like, you know how we always say hindsight's a wonderful thing? In hindsight, there were a lot of things that I think if they all presented at the same time would have led me to check that out a lot earlier than what yeah. I did. Um, because for me, when I hypo, one of my first things that I notice is my hands tremor. Now, I can remember being like 12, 13 and showing my mum and dad being like, look at my hands, why are they doing that? And, mm. you know, I'd gone to the doctor and stuff for it and they'd put it down to that I just had too much adrenaline or, you know, maybe I needed to take something for that so my body wasn't buzzing all the time. Um, you know, I was having irregular periods and different things like that, but also being younger, it does take a while to kind of get on a, you know, certain cycle and your body to figure out all of that. And that can take years. So, you know, that's one thing, but it wasn't the major thing. But I think if you put it all together at once, you'd start going, well, that kind of reminds me of type one diabetes maybe you should be checked for that yeah the thirst the needing to go to the toilet that um overwhelming thirst but not being able to drink much the weight loss like some children or some people 
can lose a staggering amount of weight over a weekend. You know, they can lose 10, 15 kilos over a weekend and then they're being dragged into emergency because they're in ketoacidosis where their body is just giving up. Um, You know, so I'm so lucky that that didn't happen to me. I was just very much in what they call the honeymoon period when I was diagnosed. So the honeymoon period means that your pancreas is still working that little bit but has nearly given up. So when I was first diagnosed, my blood sugars were pretty good. But then as it started to give out, I had to take more insulin because it wasn't, you know, sitting at that homeostasis anymore. It was that I'd eat and it'd start going up and I'd give that little bit of insulin, but then it would only bring it down to a certain amount. Mm. So I had to give more to bring it down. It was all a learning thing. Yeah. And, you know, the the older you get, especially with little kids, because they're going to go through different hormone changes and especially in puberty, that can be a really tough time of figuring out your diabetes because hormone fluctuations like when you have your period to when you're ovulating to when you're not is all different levels too and affects you, which I only learnt in the last few years and I've been a diabetic for 18 years. Yeah. You know, there's just so much coming out these days and as well as the constant glucose monitoring and pumps, it's just there's so much nowadays to help in that situation that you never would have known back in the day. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's all a learning curve, that's for sure. Uh, Mm -hmm. With the diabetes, um, have you ever had a, a scary moment, situation that you've encountered through it? I've had a few. Yeah. Um. So as I was saying before with uh, ketoacidosis, so that's when um, you have ketones in your blood. Now, normally, say, if we get a cold or we're sick, we get ketones, and that's what kind of makes us just feel off and ugh. Because we want ketones, don't don't we? But we don't we? The healthy numbers, what is it? If I was reading correctly or I was listening correctly, is it around like five or something? Oh, God, if your ketones are five, I would be very worried. Oh, maybe I'm thinking... Because when you go into fast it, that you're t- maybe you're talking about your blood sugar. Your blood sugar is good between like, let's say, five and eight. Yeah, That's a really good place to be sitting. Yeah, and if you were sitting in that all the time, you'd definitely not be a worry for type one. Yeah. Um, if you ate and then two hours later I tested your blood sugar and it's gone from four to twenty, yeah, then I'd be like, oh, Andy, I think that. You need to be looked at. Yeah. Um, ketones should be zero. And the thing that, and excuse my language, really pissed me off in the last few years is that people going on um, like keto diets, you do you, do whatever. But the fact that there was like a shortage in ketone strips for the likes of diabetics. Yeah, that wow. Test those things. Mm. I rang. Colac, Geelong, Ballarat, Warnable, and somewhere else, I think it was Camperdown, to try and locate ketone strips because I was sick and I needed to know what that number was yeah. so that I could go to hospital if I needed to. Now, nowhere had them. And it was because everyone was on this bloody diet and they were using it to make sure that they were in somewhat of a keto, like, um, ketosis state so that they were burning more fat yeah wow but it drove me insane for the fact that i'm like you do not need Mm. those that is not a need that is a want that you are doing that and for the people that need those things you are putting them in grave danger by not having them yeah so they should have like they should not have been able to give them out to those who didn't have diabetes right surely Oh, look, it used to drive me mental in the fact that one time I needed needles because I didn't have any um, little pen heads to draw insulin out yeah. and I needed them. And I had to show my licence and my um, NDSS card to show that I was a diabetic to get needles from the hospital, but yet they would give fresh needles to someone if they walked in and they wanted to use it for heroin. Like, no worries here's a whole thing and just 
really irked me Mm. that I'm like someone that legitimately needs it for life or death situation is coming and asking you for something that you should be able to provide. I don't mind that you ask me for ID. That's okay. Mm. But why aren't you asking others to do the same? Yeah, I I completely agree. Yeah. I don't want to start a rant. No, no. Go yeah, 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 yeah. No, of course, absolutely. Um, just quickly then, um, with the scenario that you've had, you said you've had a couple. What was some of those things that you you've endeavoured going through those tough times with diabetes? And was it any? Um, I don't know. I don't know what it looks like, so that's why I, want, I suppose I want to learn from you. One of the worst ones that I had was I was living in Geelong at the time, and I had two housemates, two good friends. And luckily one of them was home because she was heading out. Mm. Um, And I just said to her, I'm like, I'm not feeling well. Like I've tested my blood sugar. My blood sugar was about nine, which, yes, is a little bit elevated, but not crazy that I'd be like, you know, Mm. warning. Um, But my ketones were sky high. So it was either showing that I was sick, had an infection, or something was going on for my body to show that it was in this, um, you know, state of ketosis. But ketoacidosis is when your body is becoming basically acidic. It's, you know, not working properly. It's, you know, poisoning your body, I guess. So, Um, So I rang the diabetes educator because I'd only just gone on an insulin pump then and I didn't know a lot about it. So I was still learning in that stage. Um, And they said, well, have you changed the line and done all of those things? I was like, no, I haven't yet. I'll do that now. And then when I changed the line, you can get either like steel cannulas or plastic when you're doing the inserts into your skin. Um, Now, I had plastic at that time, and what I didn't know was it had kinked and kinked so far over that no insulin was getting in. So from when I had changed it last to when I changed it again because something may have been wrong, there was 15 hours in between. Wow. So there was 15 hours where I had not had any insulin on board but yet for some reason my pump wasn't alarming to say no insulin's going through so it was still technically saying that it's delivered this insulin to me Mm. but in fact I wasn't getting any wow So, so what happened so I changed the line but by that time I was just so ill like I was vomiting everywhere I you know could hardly breathe. I was, you know, kind of gasping a bit. So my housemate took me into emergency in Geelong because our house is only about five minutes from there. But in the time that we got from our house to emergency, I'd stopped being able to speak and I was kind of gasping for air. And, um, you know, when you're going into there, you don't get to take and put on a stretcher and off you go you've got to wait Mm -hmm. and my friend just goes I'm sorry but who is here to help she can hardly talk and they took us up to the um little window and the lady's asking me all these questions like who are you how old are you where do you live why are you here all of these things and I just said I think I'm dying (laughs) like I was just like I need help yeah and Forget these questions. I was able to write down a few, but then they took me through into emergency and they're like, you know, she's in ketoacidosis, we need to get a line in, all of those things. But I was so severely dehydrated hmm. that they had 15 attempts at getting a line in and then decided to get an ultrasound machine to try and find my veins because I was so far down couldn't come to the surface because of how dehydrated I was. And then they ended up having to have three or four goes to get an arterial line because they couldn't get any here. And, yeah, I think they had three, yeah, three goes. I think it was 18 jabs 
I'd had. So I was just like covered in bruises and I ended up in ICU for a few days for that one. Yeah, wow. Which, yeah, that was really bad. And then another one that I'd had, which was my first ever ketoacidosis, was, oh, no. No, that was just, I think, something had happened with the line there too. I can't remember, but that was only a few days after getting the pump and my mum came up to stay with me for the night. Mm. And then the next day I was like, I'll be fine, you know, off you go. I promise I won't play netball. And as soon as she left, I went and played netball. Typical bag. <laughs> I was just like, I can do this. Um, <laughs> but that was the night before my dad died. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.